070, the lovely Alice is here, logging your email, along with Adrian, Beaky, Pat and the rest of the team. First holiday charter flights, chock-a-block from this evening, twice as many as usual flying off in the next few days for Easter. But tonight, please pay attention if you're five foot nine and a half or more. Five foot nine, by the way, is the average male height. But the design for airline seats is actually based on measurements from 10 years ago when, quite literally, men were smaller. And for those above average height, a likely charge of up to £150 if you don't want to seat, sit with your knees round your ears. Calls and emails have been flooding into Watchdog since last week's report on Weekend Watchdog about non-reclining seats. It's not just the recline you cried, it's the unfairness of being an above average male. Well, in fact, we first reported on the tall people's tax 17 months ago when it was introduced by Britannia Airways. Panorama presenter Vivian White demonstrated. He's six foot seven and a half. And when I found the seat, it was as bad as I feared. Well, tonight, the seats to avoid if you're taller than average. Now, this is Robert Matthews. He's six foot ten and he's here with his fiancée, Libby Little. They're getting married in May and they're going to fly to Jamaica for their honeymoon with air tours. It's going to cost them £778 for the fortnight and the flight will be nine hours on an air tours Boeing 767. So, quite wisely, when he was booking, Robert asked his travel agent in Portsmouth to find out what seats were on offer in economy class. Well, we can tell him there are two 281 seats with nine inches of legroom plus just 11 seats with around four to five inches extra they're near the emergency exits and they cost an extra 75 pounds also there's premier girl class where there's 21 seats which actually have 18 inches of legroom that's nine more than economy and they cost an extra 149 pounds so robert you're now in a standard a economy seat how does that feel very uncomfortable does it? Do you think you could manage for nine hours on that? No, not really. I'd have to, think I'd have to take my legs off and put them in the cabin above. Right, OK. Well, that's not a very satisfactory solution. Um, what I want you to do now, we'll leave Libby there. Can you come and try this seat? Now, if you're on your flight, this would actually be near the emergency exit and you'd have another four to five inches. Now, you're cheating there because you're pushing. That's right. How's that for a flight for nine hours? Not really any better than the seat behind. Right. So you wouldn't pay the extra money for that? Definitely not. So what's been your solution? Well, the only solution is to go to the extra legroom seats, um, the premium gold seats, which right. is an extra £150 each. Right. I bet that was Libby's decision, was it? <laughs> Definitely. OK. So there, what you'll get, actually, you'll get more legroom, you'll get a wider seat, and, of course, you'll get newspapers and um, free drinks, and uh, you'll get a personal screen, won't you? to watch uh, the movie. Yeah. OK, thank you very much for coming in and have a wonderful honeymoon. Um, we've also heard from Barbara Emerton. She emailed us on Friday. She flew to Mexico with a party with Air 2000 on Tuesday. Now, Barbara's husband, Peter, is six foot two. Her son is six foot three, and his friend, Stephen, is six foot two. And so when the Emertons booked with Portland Direct, which is part of Thompson in September, they asked for economy seats near the emergency exit so as to get extra legroom between 31 and 70 inches. The cost to reserve them was 60 pounds. Alternatively, said Portland Direct, you can check in early at Gatwick and ask for the emergency exit seats. And here are the Emertons on Tuesday at Gatwick's North Terminal. Now, according to their brochure, check-in opened at 8.30 in the morning and the Emerton party arrived at 7.30 and appeared to be the first in the queue. But when they actually checked in, there were no extra legroom seats left. In fact, passengers sitting in emergency exit seats told the Emertons they had pre-booked them, so there was actually never any chance for the Emertons. Air 2000, in fact, have an interesting rule. If any of the Emertons had been just a bit taller, six foot four or more, Air 2000 wouldn't have charged for the extra seats and they would have allowed pre-booking. We will, I promise you, be returning to this subject on Weekend Watchdog. Fear not. Next, saving money on cars abroad. Cheaper to buy, cheaper labour, cheaper fuel, etc. So much so, Eddie Stobart, that hero and famous for his fleet of 850 trucks, is registering 200 of them in Luxembourg. And for ordinary car owners, cheap deals too. They can cut servicing costs by up to half. Adrian reports. <laughs> Calais, northern France, gateway to Europe, with 19 million visitors every year, most from the UK, heading for a continental holiday or stocking up on fine wines and delicious cheeses. 
But Frenchman Jean Bernardi, who's lived in London for 30 years, comes here for another French delicacy. The car service. Mais oui, mais pourquoi pas? Why not indeed? Jean Bernardi drives a Renault 21 1.7 litre engine, a 1990 model with 94,000 miles on the clock. When it needs a service, it comes to Calais. People say I'm mad to come and have my car serviced here. But really, I would be mad not to come here. Uh, I save so much money by doing so. And it is only a day trip, really. Jean Bernardi goes to Renault dealers in the Calais area. His last service at 90,000 miles costs £100 at a Renault garage in France. In London, for the same work, we were quoted a price of £240. Of course, Jean Bernardi is a French speaker driving a French car in France. But how would the rest of us fare if we wanted our car serviced here? Well, I've crossed the channel equipped with nothing more than my handy French phrase book. And I'm driving a very handy non-French car, a Mercedes. Just like yours, Annie. Most of the major car companies have authorised garages within easy reach of Calais Port. The Mercedes dealership is around a 20-minute drive from the centre of town. Excusez-moi, monsieur. Bonjour, monsieur. Je ne parle pas français. Je suis mm. English. Oui. Uh, je voudrais un service pour the car. Ah, you want to get your car serviced here? Yeah. Is that what you want? Yeah. Okay. Oh, absolutely no problem. If you come with me into the office, I will get you a quote. Oh, okay? Brilliant. Of course, if you have a major problem with your car, a day trip may not be long enough. But a service usually takes about three and a half hours. Time to nip into town in my courtesy car and a chance to get to grips with French literature. And then pop into the patisserie to sample the local cuisine. Before giving the locals a lesson in boule. The saving was impressive. In London, I was quoted £440 for my Mercedes service. In Calais, £311, allowing £40 for petrol and a £20 day return on the Dover Calais ferry. I saved £69 in all. We also compared service prices at authorised dealerships around Calais and Dover for other cars. Chrysler's 4-litre Jeep Wrangler, French service, £88 cheaper. A Mazda MX-5, £131 cheaper in France. And our biggest saving on a Peugeot 306 Cabriolet, £135. Leaving plenty of cash for Jean and I to enjoy some of the finer things in France. Santé. Santé. Another nice trip he's had. Now, in total, we had a look at service charges for seven popular makes, and apart from a Renault quote we got from a dealer in Dover, all the servicing was cheaper in France, and you've got some more details there. Well, that's right, Andy. The manufacturers say they can't tell garages how much to charge. They can only give a recommended price for a service, but it's ultimately up to the garage to set the final figure, and a case in point is Renault. Remember, Mr Bernardi's service, much cheaper in Calais, than in London. But Renault point out that he needn't have gone to France. He could have got an even cheaper service in Dover, just but, £92. But Dover's probably not such a good comparison, is it? Because Dover probably have to compete. So they're aware they're competing with well, France. Indeed. And interestingly enough, we contacted Renault dealerships today in Birmingham and Newcastle and both quoted more for Mr Bernardi's service than his garage in Calais did. But so. a handy tip too from Chrysler, they say if you are prepared to cross the water for a service, why not try the Shetland Islands? Cheaper even than France. Oh, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> we like the Shetland Islands. We yeah. love the Shetland Islands, but not to drive all the way there to have our car service. Just trying to stop you getting into trouble from all the people who live on the Shetland Islands. <laughs> <laughs> we love the Shetland Islands. OK, so news this week of the biggest court action against a tour operator. 630 holidaymakers who were affected by an outbreak of food poisoning at the club Aguamar in Menorca last June have issued a writ through the High Court against Sunworld. The tour operator has admitted responsibility, but there's no agreement yet as to how much they're going to pay up. Sunworld told Watchdog today that the illness was an isolated incident and both the hotel and themselves have gone to great lengths to prevent a recurrence. A team of hygiene consultants inspected the kitchens following the outbreak and will do so throughout the summer season. 
We'll keep you up to speed on how that court case goes. It's an isolated incident involving more than 600 people. <laughs> I wasn't going to say anything. Shall I give you some quick emails? Yeah. Barbara Thomas from Coventry has just emailed. She says, we're pleased. she's pleased we've covered the air to seating arrangements. She's six foot tall and usually asks for an aisle seat, but this time was charged £20. She says they make her feel like a freak. Mark Saunders emailed to tell us about Debonair, whose mission statement is our airline is founded upon the philosophy there's nothing that cannot be done, but they cannot or will not change the name on his flight ticket to Nice, not even with an admin charge. The seats now run out and they won't even let bu him buy back his own seat under a different name. And um, Andrew wants to know from a mother and daughter team like Nanette Newman and Carol Vorderman. They're not mother and daughter. No, Anyways, had not. a bet. We're not. You lost your bet. Sorry. No, no. <laughs> It'd be very nice to have as a daughter. Mm -hmm. In a minute, Barrett's waterlogged gardens. Nothing to do with us, said Barrett. Beaky flies to the rescue. Now, before that, Oakley sunglasses. Uh, 16 designs. Prices range from 55 to 200 pounds. Very cool. They suit me. I can't tell. It's dark in here. <laughs> anyway, these are eye jackets. Uh, one of the most popular. They cost 80, but there's a snag. Alice reports. The thing is, if you want to be cool, you've got to look cool. Get your image right. When you're trying to live life to the max, you need shades that meet the challenge. This group of friends from Gloucestershire chose Oakley's eye jackets, the trendiest glasses on the slopes. Or anywhere, actually. Eye jackets are designed for sport. They look good. But can they stand the pace? One in 20 pairs goes back to the shop with problems. And it's no joke being without your sunnies. First of all, the lenses popped out, um, so I sent them back. They've broken three times, um, three times in the same places. The two main problems being a broken arms uh, in two places. My sunglasses have broken twice on either arm, at the top where it joins the main frame underneath the rubber seal where the plastic actually goes quite thin. I've had my glasses about six months. Uh, they snapped within three months. I go surfing, snowboarding, skiing, so they were supposed to be ideal. However, they do keep breaking, and to be quite frank, it's just not good enough. So, what's the problem? Oakley says their eye jacket sunglasses are specifically designed to sit on the nose with the earpieces behind the temple. Naughty, naughty, put those glasses back on your nose. Whoops. Now, I know I'm not the only one round here who wears her sunglasses on her head. Excuse me. Excuse me, madam. What do you think you're doing? They shouldn't be up there. Why are you wearing your sunglasses up there? Because it saves me putting factor 10 on my hair. And you lot, too. Get your sunglasses down on your nose this All case. models, all posh people wear them up there. Well, you're not posh. You're from <laughs> Southport or some <laughs> Liverpool, so put them down. Blundell Sands. Far from Blundell Sands, this is the Alps. My Oakleys are still in one piece, and I'm off to do a spot of snowboarding. You look lovely in that jacket. Thank you. Anyway, shops we spoke to uh, say Oakley has been very good at replacing broken glasses in the past. Oakley say wearing glasses on your head puts undue pressure on the arms and they can snap, but redesigns are taking place all the time. I cannot see, Alice, the point of making sunglasses that aren't designed to cope I know. with Actually, your these, hair. these feel as though they grip rather well I on mean, my they head. They have several like uses, sunglasses. sunglasses. They do indeed. Oakley also say they don't believe there's any significant problem with breaking of the arms on their eye jackets. They have a 12-month warranty and will replace glasses if they break within that time, no matter how the damage was caused. So even if you go at them with an axe, they'll still replace them, which is rather good of them. Oakley yeah. also say that glasses have been tested in America and meet national standards there. Now you've mucked your hair up, haven't I know. you? First time on television, you've mucked your hair up. <laughs> Amazing. The glue's come out. Anyway, <laughs> thank you, Alice. Next, Walker Crisps, the biggest brand in the country and an old favourite of Watchdog. What I really, really want to know is why these bags of Walker's crisps are shrinking. That was last year when we reported on how packets had gone from 28 grams to 24. Then, of course, Gary had already given his name to Salt and Lineker. And tonight, the launch of the TV ad for Walker's newest brand, Cheese and 
Owen on the other side for the first time at 20 past eight, which brings us to Ross Boothroyd, who's nine years old and lives in the Wirral. Now, he's an Evertonian and an England supporter, and he was naturally glued to the World Cup, cheering England on and eating crisps, lots of crisps. So much so, a thought occurred to him. We saw Michael Owen score a brilliant goal, so I thought of a name in Cheese and Owens because Michael Owen was so brilliant in the game. And as soon as the match was finished, Ross scribbled down his bright idea and sent it to Walkers. Three weeks later, a letter from Donna Brooks, assistant consumer care manager, thanking him but disappointing news. Unfortunately, we are unable to accept your idea as we are only able to use our own agency that thinks of new ideas for us. In other words, thanks Ross, but no thanks, no check in the post, but a certificate of merit for his efforts. And so to three weeks ago when Ross was shopping with his mum Denise in Liverpool and spotted the new Walker's packet which said, Cheese and Owen. As I explained to him, it was a coincidence and he, shouldn't, he should be very pleased that great minds do think alike. Which is true because Matthew Bacon, who's 12 and lives in Surrey, also came up with the Cheese and Owen idea. And in December, he too sent it to Walker's Say, reply, same certificate. In fact, Walker's Say tonight, 70 great minds were thinking alike. So who got paid? Abbott Mead Vickers got paid, who aren't nine years old or even 12 years old, but a huge advertising agency. Have you had any bright ideas lately, Alice? Many. How about this? Smokey Beckham? You can have a merit certificate for that. <laughs> I'd rather have the Very money. <laughs> rather have the money. They won't pay you. No, never mind. OK. Very clever. Now, ski insurance and the underwriters who've refused a claim from a skier stranded in those recent avalanches in Austria. 100,000 tonnes of snow hit the resort of Galta on February the 24th. And 38 people died. The resort was completely cut off. 25,000 very frightened holidaymakers were confined to chalets and hotels. David Dunn's party was among them. They were skiing in the Paxnor Valley next to Galtor when the avalanche actually struck and everyone was told specifically by the police to stay indoors. In fact, the Dunn party couldn't get out for seven days and they were eventually airlifted by the Austrian army and they were indeed very grateful and relieved to have survived. But the extra seven days had blown their budget. So David Dunn put in a claim on his ski insurance book through World Choice and he enclosed a letter explaining his personal situation which was that he had to pay for another flight home which was £131. There was the extra accommodation charges for seven days, £185. Food was £61. And he's missed a week of work. He's a freelance engineer, which he calculated at £538. So a total there of £917. But GE Capital Insurance, who underwrite World Choice, saw things differently. Whilst your travel insurance policy is very comprehensive, we are unfortunately unable to assist you on this occasion which is odd because their policy actually states that we will pay you up to a thousand pounds for reasonable and necessary extra travel and accommodation expenses to allow you to get to your destination abroad or return home if scheduled public transport services fail or are disrupted well, David Dunn had been stranded. No public transport was available. Tonight, via watchdog GE Capital, have changed their tune. Goody, goody. They admit a serious error was made when the complaint came in and apologise. And anyone who gets in touch will now be able to claim. So, a result. Now, Barrett Homes. They claim to be Britain's premier builder. Remember this ad from 16 years ago? All over Britain, Barrett helped more people buy houses than any other builder for singles, the retired, young couples and growing families. Barrett, building houses to make homes in. Fantastic, they don't make them like that anymore. Now, this is one of their latest sites, Crofters Meadow in Penwortham, Lancashire. Live in the peace and tranquility, beautiful rural surroundings. Houses ranging from between £88,000 and £172,000. Very popular too. There's only five of the 51 left. But a problem, Beaky reports. This week, Watchdog have sent me on a very important mission off to the Lancashire countryside, just south of the River Ribble. I've been dispatched to have a look at some very soggy gardens. I get all the fun jobs. And here we are at Crofter's Meadow. At number 51 in this £110,000 house lives Alan Lucas. He bought it in May. 
We wanted to move into an area that was quite unspoilt and in the country and uh, when we first looked at the estate we saw the development and saw that the road was going to be called Meadow Leach. Alan didn't think it was a very nice name for a street. He applied to the council to have the name changed to Meadow Reach. They did just that, but the old name Leach came back to haunt some residents. You see, Leach also means to pass water through something, and in this case, it was Alan's garden. His children love it. They enjoy playing football and even the odd bit of fishing, but their dad hates it. I just can't do anything about it. I mean, I've tried raising the borders. I've added lots of soil to the garden to raise the levels. I've even had to dig a big hole in one corner of the garden for the water to drain away into. But I end up just emptying that every weekend and it soon fills up again. Alan phoned Barrett's in September. He was told he needed a drainage system, but Barrett's refused to pay for it. His garden got worse, so in January he wrote to Barrett's. They said that according to the National House Builders Council, the NHBC, Barrett's don't have to pay up unless the water problem is within three metres of the house. Then Alan got in touch with Watchdog. <coughs> First, we had some gardening suggestions. Quite frankly, I don't know what the fuss is about. I've been looking for a little bug and I've got some great ideas. I'm sure I could squeeze some flowers in here somewhere. Well, no, actually. We've been told not if the ground's waterlogged. You could build a swimming pool. Sorry, difficult if your ground's waterlogged. Well, I suppose you could make a feature of it. You could have a nice little pond garden with flowers and ducks. Look, I've even got your watchdog gnome. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Number 48, behind Alan Lucas's house, also has a drainage problem. Denise and Andrew Lum paid £128,000 for it in July. They're having problems with their wobbly fence. My daughter has a climbing frame which she can't make any use of at all, and at least two-thirds of the garden is absolutely waterlogged. Barrett's refused to sort out their garden problems for the same reason, the three-metre rule. Number 41 belongs to Nigel and Mary Westgarth. Almost immediately after they moved in, water started collecting outside their back door. We complained about it in December. They came and had a look at it in January and said they would come back again in the springtime, which I felt wasn't correct because for six months of the year, the garden is going to be very wet and it's going to be collecting outside the back door. It's no good looking at the problem during the spring when it's dry. Not a word from Barrett since then. So the Westgarths complained to the NHBC three weeks ago, who said they'd send someone round on the 8th of April. But since Watchdog got involved, Barrett's have come round. In fact, they came round last Friday to install this new drainage system. And what about Mr Lucas and the Lums? They had been ready to protest last weekend against Barrett's. They'd even made their own banner. But after Watchdog got involved, Barrett's had a change of heart. They've agreed to install three new drainage systems. So down with the banner. Another result there. The Westgarths, Alan Lucas and the Lums delighted with their new unclogged gardens. And Beaky's got a response from Barrett's. I have. I've got a fax. And they say, we very much regret that this situation has arisen. Surface water drainage is not a general problem on this development, although it has affected these properties. And they go on to say that they offered to install some additional drainage on these properties as a goodwill gesture on their behalf. Finally, they say that regarding Mr Lucas's garden, measures taken by the owners themselves greatly contributed to the collection and accumulation of water. It's so much easier for so many firms if there were no customers making a nuisance <laughs> of themselves. Thanks, Beaky. Next, the driving test. 100,000 of them taken each month, but the booking system is in chaos, quite literally. Complaints piling in from learner drivers who can't get through by phone. Patch reports. Swati Bagat has been fitting driving lessons around studying for her A-levels. Last month, she failed her practical test, but is now ready to give it another go. The easiest way to book is by telephone, and the Driving Standards Agency has one number for the whole country. I've been ringing up about ten times every day for about two weeks now, and I just can't get through. 
it's either busy or you get through to the answer machine. Please hold while we transfer you. And it cuts you off. Out of all the times I've rung, I've got through twice. The guy at the other end just said, oh, well, our computer systems are down and I can't book your test. I'm scared the longer the gap is, the worse my driving's going to get. Tristan Stevens is also an A-level student and has been calling four times a day for the last week to try and book his test. My instructor says I'm ready to take it now, but if I leave it any longer, I'll be getting overconfident and start developing bad habits. Trainee Alison Durkin has also been having difficulties. We've been ringing the phone number up to 25 times a day, and it's just getting ridiculous. The Driving Standards Agency appears to be well aware of the situation. On March 22nd, it sent a letter to all approved driving instructor associations. In it, it said that the problems have been caused by the installation of a brand new computerised booking system. This has had, in their own words, a number of teething problems, exacerbated by the fact that each call takes about 50% longer to answer, due in part to people asking about the new driving test. Also, during the first week of the new system, the Driving Standards Agency reduced the advanced booking time for a test from 10 to 8 weeks, which caused pent-up demand. The result? On occasion, over 10 times more calls to the booking line, with much less chance of you reaching an operator. The solution, said the Driving Standards Agency, stop repeatedly redialing. They'll receive fewer calls, the phones won't be engaged as much, and you'll be able to get through. It's another outfit with customers who are a nuisance. <laughs> did you pass your driving test first time? Of course, did you? Yes, of course I did. Did you, Adrian? Vicky? Pat? Oh. Sack them now. <laughs> um, a bit more on driving tests from Marope Mills. I don't know if that's a, a female or a male actually. M R E R O P E. Very unusual. He passed his test last December after three tries at about a thousand pounds worth of driving lessons. This morning he got a letter from the Driving Standards Agency saying his examiner had been found to fail to maintain the pass requirements indicated by the Department of Transport and that his driving license had been rendered temporary invalid until he takes and passes another test. Oh. That's rotten. He's a final. A, final student he can't get through to the head office to book one. Fenella Oatley on airline seats. This is pure genius. Her and her husband are tall, 5'11 and 6' tall. She says they wait until the safety video's on and then they say to the stewardess, we can't safely assume the crash position in these seats because we're too tall. And every time she says it works. By that point, the plane is, is taxiing along the runway. They can't create a fuss, so they move them up. She says one time they were even moved up to first class. So That's you know what? Completely brilliant, brilliant wheeze there. I know. I don't think it would work with you, though, do you? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> no, it's quite good. Thank you. Anyway, thank you, Alice. That's it for this evening. No weekend watchdog tomorrow, but back next week, and we'll be here on Thursday. Until then, from all of us on the team, especially Alice. Good night. Next tonight on BBC One, will Grant turn up to the wonderful wedding of Walford? EastEnders next. And BBC Two is following some of Britain's most talented design graduates in making it in a couple of minutes. starting join us live throughout april on bbc television and radio 5 live good friday's big movie now on bbc one starring tom cruise and nicole kidman far and away